Democrats. Now, I am a proud Democrat, and I represent the 13th Congressional District in Alameda County. Good afternoon. Let me first take a moment to thank our magnificent chair, my friend who I served with in the California Assembly and Senate, John Burton, who is really leading our California Democratic Party in a bold and brilliant way. I love you, John, and thank you. Also, let me take a moment and acknowledge and thank our leader, my speaker, Nancy Pelosi. First of all, Now, I just have to take this moment to say this, Nancy. I, I have to thank her for her amazing vision and working day and night to elect Democrats to Congress and making our Democratic caucus the most diverse in the United States history. The most diverse. Also, she's leading our way. When women succeed, America succeeds. Give Nancy a round of applause for that because, you know, she was, and I had the privilege to witness her being inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. And so thank you, Speaker Pelosi, once again in November for your leadership and for your friendship. I am truly honored and humbled today to be able to introduce my colleague, who is a friend and another bold and brilliant leader. Representative Keith Carson represents Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in the House. But let me just say this, before his swearing in, you may have remembered this, Congressman Ellison announced that he would use the Quran, the Muslim holy book, instead of the traditional Bible. He found himself in the middle of a religious firestorm, receiving criticism from conservative politicians and journalists, as well as many other American citizens. But you know what? Ellison did not let this latest controversy disrupt his plans. He moved forward, he moved forward, and he made us all very proud and stood on behalf of religious freedoms in our country. Also, and we care about this here in California very much, he is a big supporter of stem cell research and raising the minimum wage. And he also, if you remember, as did Leader Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, he voiced his opposition to President George W. Bush's increase in the number of troops fighting in the war in Iraq. Keith led on that. Also, I just have to say, his guiding philosophy, philosophy excuse me, is based on generosity and inclusion, democratic values. And his priorities in Congress are building prosperity for working families, promoting peace, pursuing environmental sustainability, and ad advancing civil and human rights. Now, Keith was elected co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus once again for the 113th Congress. And I have to just say, the Progressive Caucus continues to be the largest caucus in our Democratic Caucus. And of course, our core principles, Democratic principles, are fighting for economic justice and security for all, protecting and preserving our civil rights and civil liberties, promoting global peace and security, and advancing environmental protection and energy independence. But also, Keith is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, and he founded the Congressional Consumer Justice Caucus that begins to focus more than a dozen other caucuses on issues ranging from social inclusion to environmental protection. Now, Congressman Ellison, I just have to say this on a personal level, he's a legislator, He's an activist, but he's also an organizer. His bold leadership led to the president signing the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage for employees of federal contractors to $10.10 an hour. Keith led us on that effort. And you may have seen him during the shutdown. 
He led our efforts, and Leader Pelosi, we all stood with Keith, standing with federal workers, demanding that the government be opened back up. Keith Ellison led on that. He led the Progressive Caucus on a jobs tour and on a national tour to stand with fast food workers, raising our voices to raise the minimum wage, but also supporting a living wage. Keith on the outside as an organizer. And finally, let me just say on a personal level, I met Keith way before he ran for Congress, way before he ran for Congress. And I knew then that he would be a national leader who would be part of the change, part of the change that this country so desperately needs. So I am proud to call Keith Ellison my friend, my brother, and my colleague. Let us give Congressman Ellison a California Democratic Party, a California welcome. Come on up, Keith. And I really like that tune, Won't Back Down. We won't back down, is that right? We ain't gonna back down. First of all, put your hands together for Local 11 Unite Here. Those are the people getting you fed right now. I also want to give a strong and hearty thanks to uh, Chairman John Burton, who uh, took me on a walk back through memory lane about some of my own Minnesota legislators. Uh, but uh, let me just tell you, what a joy, what an absolute undiluted joy it is to be here with you, California Democrats. Let me hear you. Any, de any Democrats in the house right now? You know, I tell you, I, I, but we are in a moment in time where I believe that we can't back down. In fact, we got to stand up and fight. We might even want to go out and pick a fight. And you could, seriously, you guys... You guys know what I'm talking about because in your state legislature, you haven't backed down. You passed an increase in the minimum wage, is that right? Good action on climate justice. Scholarships for young people. You know this student debt is killing our kids and you guys didn't sit back and let them do it. DLs, driver's license for immigrants who need to be able to get around. How about a little bit of justice for folks who are in the immigration fight? And what about early expansion in Medicaid? So you guys are fighters. Oh, and by the way, online voter registration, that's a good idea. So you guys, you guys know about fighting. You know what we're up against. But if you look around our nation and you look around this country and if you look at Washington, D.C., where we work every day, you know good and well that we need to fight because Republicans have stagnated our wages 40 years running now. They have shut down our government. 16 days, closed off services for people. They skyrocketed income inequality. Oh, yes, we've got to pick a fight, folks. They sought to kill off everything we hold dear, things that you and I care about, things like the right to organize and have a voice on the job. What about that? Things like fighting for health care for all Americans, everybody. What about the right to a, for a fair wage, for a fair day's work? And what about fighting against uh, this, this climate injustice and we can't stand by and just, just let our planet go to pot because these people just want to pursue all these uh, industrial uh, production without any regard to our planet? No, no, no. We, gotta, we insist, and you all have been fighting, on the right to retire in security, not in poverty. And you all are fighting and standing firm on women's pay equity. Yes, indeed, when women succeed, America succeeds. Isn't that right, Nancy Pelosi? Yeah. No, no, we've got to stand up and fight because you know what? These guys want to see government for the, they want to see government for the money, not for the many. And instead of promoting inclusion and opportunity, Republicans want to promote a society of your own, your own. And by the way, we've had enough. We've had enough, and I'm sure that you here in California, as you lead us 
all the time in America are ready to lead again. Is that right? I just want to say we're living in a progressive moment, and it's happening here, but it's happening all over the country. And I want you all just to bear with me for a moment because I want to tell you about some exciting developments all over this country. I want to tell you about stories from real people who will inspire you the same way that Cesar Chavez inspired, inspired us to fight against worker exploitation, in the same way that the Montgomery bus boycott workers stood up for people who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We are in a progressive moment, and I just want to tell you about some people who are doing some awesome things. The first one I want to tell you about is a young lady named LaQuasia Legrand. You know about LaQuasia? LaQuasia is 22 years old, has a winning smile, stands six feet tall, and she makes minimum wage at, K at a KFC in New York City. She makes so little money that she has to live with four other adults and two children in a one-bedroom apartment. And she can't afford to eat the fast food that she makes for people every day. LaQuasia, though, shows not to accept the situation. She fought back. Last year, she started rallying with workers and other fast food chains all over this country, and she demanded a higher wage and the right to unionize. She said, we can't survive on 725. She said, she said, hold the burgers, hold the fries, make my wages supersized. <laughs> LaQuasia even learned a little Spanish. She got with her, she got with her Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters and said, Obama, escucha, estamos en la lucha. <laughs> so, you know, some of y'all know what that means. So in December, fast food workers went on strike in over 130 cities, from San Diego to Fremont, from Berkeley to Compton, right here in good old California, and all over uh, America. It was the biggest wave of job protests in the history of fast food. But it didn't stop there. Federal contract workers demanded fair wages too. People who serve in places like the Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian, places in Washington, D.C. that we see every day, these folks were paying so little, getting so little money, so little pay, that they couldn't survive on their money either. And they asked the federal government to say, look, raise our pay as a condition of holding a federal contract, insist that pe these people pay a fair wage. And I'm telling you that over two million federal contract employees were earning poverty wages more than Walmart or McDonald combined. And you know what, they came to the Progressive Caucus, which I'm privileged to be the co-chair of, and they said, you know, Uncle Sam should not be the low wage leader. Uncle Sam should not be the low-wage leader, but he was, sadly. And we in the Progressive Caucus and the Democratic Caucus, we took our fight alongside these workers, and many of these workers bravely went on strike despite having no union protection. Imagine going on strike making $7.25 with no union. 50 members of Congress and 11 senators, led by Bernie Sanders, wrote to the president asking for an executive order to help these workers. Tens of thousands of workers joined the fight across the country, and the president probably got tired of seeing us go on TV demanding for him to issue that executive order. But I knew the president's heart was in the right place. We just couldn't get his signature in the right place. But, but the president recently signed that executive order, and we're glad that he did requiring that federal contractors pay at least 10, 10 an hour. Now, some people said, well, you know, Keith, it's only going to help about 250,000 families. I said, yeah, but it's going to help 250,000 families. <laughs> and by the way, it's an important signal because the Uncle Sam should not be the low-wage leader. Uncle Sam should set good labor conditions for workers all across America. And the president, I was so proud of the president when he said, if you cook our troops meals and wash their dishes, you should not have to live in poverty. And LaQuasia was right there at the ceremony where the president signed that executive order, recognizing her efforts for standing up for low-wage workers. This 22-year-old woman, she is on fire with the cause of social justice. A new leader has been born, you guys. But let me just tell you this. She not the only one, that's over there in New York. What about right here in California? Many of you know Eliseo Medina. 
Ella Sayo Medina was born in Delano, California, went to school through the eighth grade, then became a grape picker full time. At 19, he was part of the historic United Fine Workers strike and worked alongside Cesar Chavez as a union organizer. Si se puede. Si se puede. That's right. El Aseo has done enough work for working people to fill several lifetimes, whether organizing public workers with the University of California system or winning better wages and benefits for thousands of workers in the Justice for Janitors campaign. But he's tireless. And last year, El Aseo focused moral attention. He drew the moral attention of the nation to the 11 million undocumented workers in the United States and the need for the House of Representatives to pass a humane immigration bill. In the tradition of Cesar Chavez and Mahatma Gandhi, Eliseo and others fasted for 22 grueling days, drinking only water and eating no food day after day. Eliseo took dramatic and drastic action because he knows that our immigration system is in a moral crisis and is absolutely broken and must be changed immediately. 11 Hundred people a day are being deported. More than one person a day is found dead in the desert. Children coming home wondering whether their mom or dad is in ICE detention. Workers who are scared to organize for fear of reprisal, creating a shadow workforce and driving wages down for everybody. This is a crisis. The Fast for Families movement is taken head on as they spread across the United States, pushing for just, fair immigration reform. And let me tell you, we all need to be standing right next to them. Now, now I want to tell you about another movement. I want to tell you about another movement because if you was, as you are fighting for justice here in California, you are not alone. Let me tell you about Moral Mondays in North Carolina. Anybody heard of Moral Mondays? Moral Mondays, the face of the movement is a fellow named Reverend William Barber II. He's, a, he's the head of the NAACP there in North Carolina. Now, Republicans recently took over all of North Carolina state government and they haven't been shy. They left over 500,000 poor residents without health care insurance by refusing Medicaid expansion. They slashed education spending. They allowed concealed guns on college campuses. Can you believe, is that what we really need, folks? They rejected aid for long-term unemployed, and they passed the country's worst voter suppression law in the nation. Reverend Barber, he didn't get sad. He got mad. <laughs> he and people where he works with stood up in the face of this onslaught and announced a movement for a new South and a new North Carolina and a new future. The Moral Mondays rallies did more than call out the injustices being perpetrated by the North Carolina Republicans. They also brought together caring progressives of all colors, all cultures, and all faiths. Starting last April, they uh, turned out week after week and hundreds have faced arrests, but the protests have only grown. On a Saturday in February, more than 80,000 protesters turned up for what may be the largest civil rights rally in the South since the Selma March. There were union members, sorority sisters, LGBT activists. There were women's rights defenders. At that rally, there was an imam, a rabbi, and a preacher and a priest all speaking. One participant had a sign that said, I stand with so many groups here. I couldn't just pick one. <laughs> and you know, it reminds me of something my mom used to say. You know, my mother, she's, she's one for sayings, you know. She's from Natchez, Louisiana, and she had a saying for just about everything. She said, you know, you can curse the darkness or you can light a candle. <laughs> you, Eliseo, Laquasia, and Reverend Barber are lighting candles. Now, my dad put it a little more crass. He said any jackass can kick down a barn, but it takes a carpenter to build one. <laughs> and let me tell you, he's not the first one who said it, but he said it quite a bit. And I'm telling you that right now is the moment where we got to be lighting candles and building barns. And we need to engage our country for a better life for all Americans, for paid sick leave all over America, for voting rights all over America, for fair wages all over America, to stand up for, a fa for a, our climate all over America, from the hair shops to the head shops, guys, we got to get busy. And 2014 is ours, but you got to be ready to organize and fight. Now, I believe that our politics can match the inspiring energy of the people I talked about. Some of you, and some will tell you that in order to win, we have to check our values at the door. 
Some people might tell you, no, don't talk about marriage equality. Don't, don't bring up climate change. Don't talk about, you know, things like the financial transactions tax, which would bring in $350 billion a year to fund the, the things our government needs, like Head Start and unemployment insurance. Don't talk about that stuff. Just, just you know, make yourself look not too different from the Republicans, and that way you can sneak on in. Well, I'm here to bust that myth. The American people respond to conviction. The American people respond to people who believe what they're saying. And it's time to campaign like progressives and govern like them too, just like you all are doing here in California. Now, I want to read you guys a quote, and I want you to guess who said it. I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. Now, who said that? Who? Somebody said John Boehner? Who? No. I'm going to tell you who said it. It may surprise you. A man named Barry Goldwater said that. He said it in 1959. I want you to bear in mind that they have been trying to tear down the government, the people's government, our democratic government, which serves us all for over 50 years. This is not new. When you hear somebody say that kids should have a brown bag rather than a real lunch, that ain't new. Just this week, Paul Ryan said that poor kids, they don't want free school lunches. They don't want free school lunches. They want a brown bag lunch like the well-off kids. I don't know about you, but I think that little Janie would rather have a sandwich than just a brown paper bag. <laughs> Republicans seem to want empty stomachs to go along with their empty promises, but America's no better. They support raising wages, providing affordable housing, and yes, feeding the poor. So what does it mean to be progressive? It means inclusion. It means generosity. It means empowerment. And my political hero, Paul Wellstone, anybody remember him? He wrote a response to Barry Goldwater's uh, book, and in his book, he, well, he, he said one of his, my favorite lines, which is, we all do better when we all do better. And it means we support investing in infrastructure to rebuild America. It means we support good, good jobs. It means we support people when they're down on their luck and they need unemployment insurance. And these Republicans, ever since December 28th, have left the unemployed all alone, and now there are two million people who are somehow trying to peace life together without any unemployment insurance at all, and it's a scandal and a shame, it means we should back the financial transaction tax a fraction of a percent like they do in other 40 other countries to help America meet its needs. It means we should close the gap. We should close the gap between CEO pay and the pay of the average worker, which has gotten to obscene levels. So how do we campaign like progressives? How do we campaign like progressives? We lead with our values. We, we expand the electorate. How do we lead with our values? Well, in 2011 in Minnesota, Republicans proposed to have an amendment to our state constitution requiring to have a government issued ID to vote. And the smart people, I'm talking about the people on our side, said, well, you can never defeat it because they did some early polling and 80% of the Minnesotans we're in favor of photo ID thing. And we said, we don't care nothing about your poll. We care about what's right and what's wrong. And we are going to fight this thing. And we decided to get out there and convince people that this was a bad idea, and we did it with conviction. We pointed out that millions of qualified voters do not have government issue photo ID, particularly seniors, people with disability, young people, and the urban poor, and the rural poor. What do people and people of, what do young people and people of color have in common? Well, they often vote for they often don't vote for Republicans. So what was this really all about? It was about voter suppression, plain and simple. And we got on the phones and we got on the doors and we started talking about inclusion. We sure had enough, and we got it out there. And people began to see that this was wrong. They heard that from the seniors who would have a hard time putting together documents and standing in line to get an ID. They heard from veterans whose military IDs wouldn't count under, the, uh, under this amendment. They heard from Native American indigenous people who were excluded, their tribal IDs would not be recognized. And with a week to go, the polls showed that we had dropped from 80% approval to down to 55. A day before the election, the polls were a tie. The final result, 
52% voted no to something that 80% that 80 were in favor of just a few months before. We beat photo ID at the polls. Yes, it can be done. And oh, the same year, Republicans tried to add discrimination to our state constitution by banning people's right to marry who they wanted to marry. The same crowd who wants government off your back wants to tell you who you can get married to. The same crowd that wants freedom wants to restrict it for people in the most personal choice they can make in their life. Well, you know, in Minnesota, because you know we're right in the middle of the polar vortex, we, we have to make up things about ourselves to believe in. And, we say Minnesota nice. We say we're nice folks out here in Minnesota. And uh, we don't have the sunshine like y'all got, so. We say Minnesota nice. And in re reference to this, uh, this, this election fight, we said Minnesota nice, vote no twice. <laughs> and you know, some people in the LGBT, LGBT community thought, well, you know, those, those civil rights people fighting for voting, they don't care about our issue. And some people in the civil rights community said, well, you know, those LGBT folks, they don't care about our issue. We ended up showing them all that we all care about the human rights and the civil rights of everyone. And we won. We beat that one too. Now, I want to talk to you about expanding the electorate. This is so important. Now, has anybody seen a movie or a play called Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross? There's a scene in this movie where this big downtown executive comes in and he's, uh, he's, whip, he's gonna fire up the, the salespeople. Y'all remember that scene? Alec Baldwin played that guy? Well, in it, he said, always be closing. ABC, always be closing. Democrats need to adopt another phrase. ABE, always be expanding. We need to always be increasing and including more people in the electorate. It needs to be part of the moral fiber of what it means to be a Democrat and a progressive to expand and include and reach out to new people to win our cause. We need to find people where they are and talk to them about what matters to them. Now this is in stark contrast to Republicans who have an ethic of suppression. You might think, Keith, you're going too far to say they have an ethic of suppression. Well, would you agree that the guy who was the founder of the Heritage Foundation and the Moral Majority speaks for the conservative cause? Well, his name is Paul Weyrich and he said, and this is a quote, I don't want everybody to vote. As a matter of fact, our leverage in elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. They don't want, you, they don't want people to vote. He does not want you to vote. And if you have any doubt about it, look at the photo ID law in Texas where it says you can vote with your gun ID but not with your student ID. So, you know, this is not only dirty politics, it's morally wrong. And we need to say excluding and suppressing people's choice in democratic government is wrong. And we need to do the opposite, always be expanding, A-B-E. Engaging people in the fundamental act of democracy is patriotic and right. And turning people away is wrong. 30 second ads don't get people to the polls. Koch brother spending doesn't get them there. Negative campaigns don't get them there. People get them there. Neighbors talking to neighbors saying, hey, we need you to make our country better is what gets people to the polls. Enthusiasm is contagious, folks. It gets into your bones, it sets you on fire, and the best thing is, all it takes is you. On the other side, with the Citizens United corporate personhood crowd, they got the money, but I'm here to tell you, and you know in your heart, that our superior numbers beats their superior dollars. If we would only organize. What's more, a good field campaign works. We know that asking people to vote face-to-face -face is more persuasive than mail or ads. We know that when you talk directly to a voter, you can speak to her concerns. You cut through the media noise. So let's get out there and ask people to vote for us. When I ran for Congress, I was told we need to turn out 10,000 new voters in my district in order for a progressive like me to win. We went out and got 10,000 new voters. We built an awesome ground game that brought in students the disengaged new Americans, like the large Somali community in my district, and our field campaign built community and friendship. I even got some campaign workers who got married last week, so. You know, you, you got a little dating service on the side. It also proved to me that people are willing to engage in politics, people want to engage in politics, and anybody who thinks that they don't get it, doesn't get it. 
Now, Texas is facing a mobilizing opportunity right now. They are seeing the superstar energy progressive like Wendy Davis and her epic tennis shoe 12-hour filibuster legislation. Uh, you know, she got up there. She didn't back down. Or like my good friend Julian Castro, who you're going to hear from tonight. And if you expand the electorate in Texas, champions like Wendy Davis can win. And if Texas goes blue, like California is so solidly blue, they are done. They are toast. We got to always be expanding. Californians, you all know this better than anyone. You seize the opportunity to show voters why uh, the share of dem and share democratic values. And it wasn't so long ago that California voted for a Republican president six times in a row. Does anybody remember that? Well, not anymore. They can't, they can't even come in here no more. They don't even waste their money trying to convince you anymore because they know better. So let me just tell you, as I begin to wrap up, I just want to mention that once we campaign like Democrats, we've got to govern like Democrats. You know, the weather, the weather in Minnesota and California may be a little different. You know, in Minnesota, we've had 53 days where it didn't even get above zero degrees, so it's a little different. But we have one thing in common. We have Democrats from the governor's office to the state senate to the state house. That's a good thing, right? And guess what? Both in Minnesota and in California, you did not squander that. In just in Minnesota, we raised taxes on the wealthy, we balanced the state budget, we invested in all-day kindergarten and preschool, we froze tuition for public colleges, we passed the Minnesota Dream Act, and, to allow, and, and we also expanded Medicaid, and we passed a law saying that if you're an adult, you can marry whoever you want to. It's not up to the government to make that decision. But in California, y'all showed us up again. Your accomplishments were incredible. Aggressive action on climate change, raising the minimum wage, middle class college scholarships, one of the best health care rollouts in the country. Give yourselves a hand for that. California Dream Act. You passed a responsible budget with a surplus, driver's license for immigrants, online voter registration, a homeowner's bill of rights, and one million new jobs since 2010. That's all right. I'm not saying you don't have more to do. We got plenty more to do, but we know we can do it because we've done some good things already. So let me just tell you, you have a lot to be proud of. Our whole country is proud of you. We look to you as a national leader. One of the things that you should be proud of is you got Nancy Pelosi here. You know, we, um, you know, it's funny. People bring up me being the first Muslim in Congress. I am a Muslim. I'm proud to be one. But, um, but let me tell you, I didn't run for office to represent my religion any more than anyone else does. But I can tell you on the day, on the, the night before we were to be sworn in, there was a dinner for uh, the new freshman, and uh, Nancy asked me to come up to the front and bless the dinner. And then after I was done, got up there and said, you know, Ms. Ellison's blessing for our food is just like anybody else's blessing would be, and we're very pleased to have him as part of this caucus. So that, for that and many other reasons, I'm honored to be in a caucus led by the best speaker in the history of the United States of America. You also have, you also have some amazing advocates like, like, like Janice Hahn. Where's my buddy Janice? You have some awesome advocates like like uh, Maxine Waters, Javier Becerra, Al Lowenstein. You also happen to have a guy named Mike Honda, a historic figure who grew up in an internment camp, who rose to be a congressman. Don't tell me anything's not possible. Love you, Michael. And you also have a person who literally inspired me to run for Congress, Barbara Lee, who introduced me. I'm telling you. Barbara, Barbara told you that before, before, I, uh, uh, b before I got to Congress, she had met me years before when she was given an award because, you know, after 9-11, our country was in a flat-out panic, and it's understandable that we would be. A lot of folks didn't know what to do, and President Bush wanted us to sign, uh, wanted Congress to pass an authorization for use of force. Barbara Lee voted 
no on it. She was the only one to do so. And 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 she came to Minnesota to accept an award, and that's where I met her. And ever since then, I've just been uh, just so much in love with Barbara Lee, y'all. <laughs> But let me just tell you, you know, two of the really awesome members that you all sent to Washington, George Miller and Henry Waxman, uh, we're going to miss them. But I have no doubt that you're going to send somebody who understands what it means to be a California Democrat and is going to uphold that fine tradition that both George and Henry have, have laid down. And so let me just say, California Democrats, you guys are an impressive bunch. You've shown what it means to campaign and govern like Democrats, but neither you nor I or anyone can coast on our accomplishments. There's much, much more to do. These folks have made income inequality an existential crisis for the American middle class. And we must stand and fight and deliver for the American people. And I'm telling you that it can be done. It can be done. In fact, our job is easier than the Republican job. And I say this because, look, what the Republicans are trying to do is convince the majority to support a program that supports the 1%. And we are trying to get the majority to support a program that supports everybody. So we, we actually have an advantage. But because we have an advantage and they know it, they know that just being right, that can be beat by deception, repetition, and, uh, and, and a whole lot of hard work and money. You and I got to figure that our superior numbers can beat their deception and their superior dollars. We've got to, we have got to plant our flag firmly in the ground on our ideals and fight for them and never back down. No, we won't back down just like Tom Petty says and we're here to fight. Is anybody here to fight? Yeah. Anybody want to pick a fight? Yeah. Let's go get it done you guys. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you, Barbara Lee. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for those lights showing off my injured nose. Uh, the convention will convene, hopefully, at 1.30. It's been a wonderful lunch. We've heard uh, very inspiring words th this morning all the way through this. We'll hear some more this afternoon and some more tomorrow. So thank all of you for participating. And the convention's out that way. Turn your left and your right, then your left, and good to go through.